All right. We are good. We are here. We are back. We are live and we have camera angles, folks. So we're, we're moving up in the world and that can have a couple of different angles. So you don't always have to look at me like this all the time, but feel free to ask any questions that you may have as we're going throughout this process. Um, I have several notes that of various things and I'm going to attempt to do a screen share um, while we're doing this as well to see how well that's going to do, going to going to go. So um, I have to bear with me for a few seconds as we get into some of the content as I do a screen share. And I want to show you some resources that I use and have used in the past to keep track of all of these um, uh, reports and various um, resources for finding the best market or finding a market that you want to move forward with. Because the market that I choose, it might not be the market you choose. So everybody's market and tolerances and various things are going to be just a little bit different. Because if, we're all, if we all were choosing the same market, that's how we compress cap rates, right? So obviously, the hotter a market, the more compression you're going to have in cap rates. Um, so we have to always be looking at different markets and, and, and basing it off of that as well. So uh, well, we're going to be going through some, some, some resources online that you can use. We're going to be going through some reports that you should be looking at. And that way you're always looking for um, various uh, um, avenues. And so that when you talk about trying to find a market, we're not trying to say that we're only doing one time type of, of research. We're not just researching a market once and that's it. Researching markets is a constant process. It's, it's not one of those things that you just do once and you don't do it ever again. You have to constantly be looking for the next market and looking for and looking at the, the numbers and the research for the market that you're in because there might be a point in time where you have to pivot and go to a different market. So you want to make sure that you're always looking for that next market. And I was just looking at the camera here and seeing this new angle that we have. So for those of you who just joined us, we're kind of toying with uh, some extra technology right now. I got two cameras going on and I can press a little button down here and switch from one camera angle to the next. So one thing I wanted to show you, I was just, I put it here if so I wouldn't forget is this new book. So this is a new book that Reed Goosen's has uh, written and it's called Investing in the U.S., The Ultimate Guide to U.S. Real Estate. So if you or any of your friends um, know uh, Reed Goosens, go grab this book. You can find it on Amazon. That's where I purchased it. He put a post on it on LinkedIn, I believe, and I saw it and grabbed it right away. Even if you yourself don't have, uh, the, aren't international, right? You're here domestically like myself. It's always good to get a resource or a book like this so that you can better discuss and better communicate with international investors. So it's not a very expensive book. It'd be a great resource for you to put on your, in your library and to put on your bookshelf. So for those of you who, Reed's probably not listening to this right now, but um, for those of you who know Reed, he's a, he's, a, he's a great resource when it comes to that. I love his accent. He's got that Australian accent. My, my accents don't usually come out very well. So I usually have like an Indian accent or an Indian Australian accent when I start to try to do accents. It doesn't usually work out too well. But I would definitely suggest getting that book and that resource so you can uh, um, check into that and kind of in, in improve your, um, your communications with international investors. So make sure you uh, dive into doing that. One thing I want to start off with when it comes to market research is your ability to understand that one the hardest thing in, in researching a market is the fact that a lot of the resources that are out there are not updated and there are constant updates being made to various resources. And so making sure that you're always looking at how old a resource is. I mean, I'm going to show you some resources that we've used recently and they're already outdated. And you'll see that because there are some of them that are dated 2017 and 2018 and even though we were in 2018 right now, it's still outdated, you know. A lot of times the moment it, the moment it's published, it is now it is actually uh, a not up, it is actually out of date. So that's the hardest thing with trying to do market research is finding data that is accurate and that is up to date. And so one of the the the, the number one resources 
um, we'll, we'll cover it later, but one of the number one resources that you can use to do market data and market analysis, market data analysis, is the census.gov, uh, the census website. And I know that might sound kind of basic, but and that's not the only resource I'm going to cover today, but that is definitely a, a big resource that you can use. So for those of you who have just, just joined us, we're going over some of these additional um, pieces on choosing a market. Um, go ahead, and there's several of you that have, that have tuned in since I made this announcement. So go ahead and type in to the Zoom chat box. Uh, make sure it says all, uh, the two, two fields says all panelists and attendees. Just let us know what city and state you are tuning in from. Got Joe from Utah, got Jack from New York, and uh, Wyman from South Carolina. Thanks for joining us there, Wyman. And, uh, and if you're on the Facebook platform, you can do that as well. Just put it into the comments box and let us know where you are. Thank you all of you for who have already registered for the upcoming Multifamily Investor Nation Summit. Um, we are doing our best to market it. So hopefully you guys are seeing us and seeing us everywhere and are um, I'm telling your family and friends about it, people who have been curious about multifamily, letting them know, hey, you need to go to this summit. You need to find out about this. So if you have a, a family member or a friend, friend and you have already registered for the summit and you want to get a coupon code or a promo code or something like that for that, shoot me an email. I, I'll help you out. Um, Dan at Multifamily Investor Nation is where you can, you can communicate with me. Um, we are also, just so you guys know, I'm going to continue the conversation of choosing the multifamily markets tonight. So um, for those of you who are following me on Instagram, you can go to Instagram.com slash Multifamily Investor Nation. Join us on our Instagram platform. Follow us there. We're going to be doing some live Instagram uh, um, uh, question and answer times in the evenings. I'm not sure if I'll be able to do every single night, but as many nights as possible, I'm going to try to jump on there and, and provide some additional you know, resource for you to ask any questions or anything like that. So um, even if you're watching this on the YouTube platform and it's after we've already done the webinar, go to our, our Instagram um, channel and follow us there and we will be um, having some nightly conversations around multifamily. So you can do that and of course join us on our Facebook group if you're not already there. You can go to multifamily, uh, um, if you go to multifamilyinvestornation.com, you're going to find on the multifamilyinvestornation.com website, there's links to our meetup page, there's links to our YouTube channel, to our Facebook group. There's also a place to join our email list so that you're notified when we have future webinars. So the first thing we talked about already today was about the hardest thing, about resources not being updated, and making sure that you look at those dates because you want to make sure that your data is, is constantly being updated. Now, when you find resources, the, 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 the resources start to dwindle when you start to go outside of a primary market. So it's a little bit harder and harder to find good data and good market research once you start to go outside of a primary market like Atlanta or Charlotte or Orlando, Jacksonville, you know, LA, uh, Seattle, Denver, those kind of markets. You can find a lot of good data on those markets because they are primary markets and there's a lot of data being, being you know, uh, gathered on those particular markets. So typically the rule of thumb is about a population size of about 65,000 or more. They should have some pretty good data somewhere on that market. But once it starts to drop below 65,000 um, population, it's a little bit harder to find because there's not, a, not, there's not enough um, people out there that I guess really care about that particular market to do a lot of analysis on it. You can still find those resources. We'll talk about a few resources today that you can still use, um, but it won't be as many. So got Brian here from Denver, Paul from Long Island, Danny from El Dorado Hills, Rocco from Colorado, Jason from Saginaw, Michigan, and got uh, Andrew from Taylor, uh, Atlanta or Taylor from Atlanta, something like that. <laughs> um, and I uh, got Sean from, from Houston, Texas. So thank you guys for all of you who have joined us. And uh, so let's talk a little bit about what you need to know before you start doing research. So, you know, as, as most of you have probably followed me, um, I have a, a big background in business in general. And so when you start to look at, and I'm a big marketer, so I enjoy marketing. I enjoy being able to uh, try to find ways to, to, to reach people. And so one of the things that you're going to want to do is sit down and no matter what market you're choosing, whether it be a primary, secondary, or a tertiary market, or maybe even farther along down the road, like a, like a, like a, a quaternary market, 
if you're doing research and trying to find that type of a market, you're going to need to be able to identify your customer avatar is what we call it in business is your avatar. It's a, it's a, it's a person that you're trying to attract. And again, when we're talking about finding a market, there's, there's, there's two different people that you have to appeal to in multifamily. Number one, you have to choose a market that is going to be uh, a, a good market for your tenant base, right? So if you're looking at C-class or B-class properties, who are the people who are going to be renting from you? What is their age? What is their age? Are they male? Are they female? Are they, you know, middle age? Are they, are they older? And, you know, or are they younger? You know, what, where, where are they as far as a demographic is concerned? So you know who you, how you can do your research. Cause I'm going to um, talk about, you know, talk and talk about looking at the population in a market. Well, when you look at a population in a market, you have to look at things that are not just how many people are in that market, because if you're trying, if your tenant is going to be your younger 20, 30, 40s, but that market has a lot of people in it, but they're all old people, 65, 75, 85, whatever, then you're not getting into a market that is the type of person you're looking for. You got to get to that, right? You got to get to that market. Um, you got to do, do your research based on who your target audience is. Now, again, if you've been on our um, other webinars that we've done about, you know, who in multifamily are we trying to, um, who, who are, as a multifamily syndicator like myself, who is my customer? My customer in market research is two people. Number one is the tenants, but it's also the investors. So that's one thing that a lot of times we, we neglect is the investors. The investors want to know that a market that we're going into is a good market. And if that market is not a good market, then we don't need to be going into it. And even if you think, oh, the numbers are all there, it's a good market, but you have to ask yourself, is this market big enough or decent enough or well-known enough that if I have to raise three, four, or five million dollars for this particular project, can I get enough of my investors to invest in it? And so one of the ways you can do that is to ask your investors about a market that you're looking at going into. You know, we've had some, some, some of our investors recently, you know, that have said, you know, I know you've been doing some deals in Texas, but what about the Carolinas? You know, what about, you know, Georgia? You know, what about Florida and Tennessee and, 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 and all those markets that are surrounding us right now? And so that's why we're going into it. So again, you have two different types of people that you're looking that you're looking to appeal to when you're doing your market research. It's your tenants to make sure that you're in a market that your tenants will actually be so that you can actually have a product to sell to them. And then you're also looking to make sure that the investors are on board with it as well. So let's go into these things a little bit further and uh, give me a shout out and let me know. If you're on Facebook, give me a comment. Let me know how you like the, the multiple camera angles. I'll press my button here. You can see we got the two angles, got one over there and then got the one in front of me. Uh, this is our first webinar trying out these different camera angles and hopefully they're coming out clear and okay. Um, and they're easy transition. So let me know on the, if you're on Facebook and in the comments, but you can also, if you are on the Zoom platform on the webinar chat box, let me know there. And then also if you're on YouTube, there's a comment box right below you. So just make a comment below us, give us a thumbs up. All of that stuff really helps us get the word out and also lets me know that you appreciate what we're doing and, and all the stuff that, all the content that we're trying to provide. So, all right. Well, Kathy says it's a fancy camera. So, or, or Bill says fancy camera work looks great. And Kathy's saying looking good. So thank you guys so much. I appreciate it. I still can't get rid of these lights. So whenever I have to do this, and the lights come back on. It's because we have a, a green building and we have energy lights. So that's kind of what happens. So, all right, let's dive into this. So things to look for. So I want you to go ahead. I'm going to cover a couple of things here first and kind of cover them and give you some specifics so that uh, you, can, you can write these down. So I want you to get out a, a pad of paper, a pen, and, uh, or pull up. If you have dual screens on your computer, put me on one screen and, and your Word document on the other. I'm going to give you a couple of things to be looking for when you're doing your market research. So first thing you want to look at, not the first thing, but one of the things you want to look at, like we have already talked about, is population. You want to look at the population, and one of the biggest, one of the best ways to do that is to do, uh, you should, you, everyone on this webinar should go to census.gov and bookmark that.
So when you're on the census website, there should be a link there for the fact finder. You could just go to factfinder.census.gov and be able to do some additional research there. Again, if it's a very, if it's a, very, if it's a larger, you know, area demographic, I mean, the larger, um, uh, uh, so if it's a larger MSA, if you will, metropolitan statistical area, larger city, then you're going to have a lot of data on the census website that's usually current by like the last year. So usually updated every year. Um, if it's a smaller market, usually it's going to be about every five years. So you're still going to have some data available, but it's going to be a little bit dated. And again, that's one of the number one flaws or the hardest things when you're trying to do market research on a not primary, a not so primary market is that some of the data is not going to be accurate. So uh, make sure you, you pay attention to that. So obviously when you're doing the population, you want to uh, make sure that the trends in that area are showing that there is population growth. And so if you go to try to invest um, and try to present to investors an area that has static population growth or a negative population growth, it's going to be very hard to have investors put money into those deals because investors need to be confident that the market is a, a good market and the market is growing. If you have negative population growth, that means people are leaving the area and that's not good when you're talking about investing in a property. You want to make sure that there is increase in the population. Now, when I talk about doing research, let's just say we wanted to do research on, uh, I don't know, let's just say um, Denver, Colorado, for example, okay? I have not done any specific research on the Denver market. I don't invest in Denver. It's not because I don't think it's a good market. It's just a lot of the markets that I do research on are ones that are going to be close to me. So Atlanta, Charlotte, Jacksonville, Raleigh, Durham, those markets, South Carolina. I, I'm, I'm in Columbia, South Carolina. So I'm doing research around these markets around me. So when you're doing mar research on markets that you want to invest in, I would suggest trying to find some good markets that are surrounding you if they're there. Now, obviously, you know, for me, if I was in New York City, I'd probably be like most of you on here and not be investing in New York City. You know, I'd be investing in other markets. And so then you have to ask yourself, well, which markets are easy for me to get in and out of by air, right? So if it's a quick trip to Atlanta or a quick trip to, you know, wherever, then those are the markets that you should be in, you should be trying to invest in, or at least trying to do some research on to see if there are going to be markets that you want to invest in. So make sure that you, you know, continue to, uh, uh, look at, you know, proximity to you and ease of access because when you close on a property, you're probably going to be there quite a bit in the first couple of months. Um, and until you get it stabilized or until you do some renovations or until you get the property management company trained or, or whatever the case may be. So you want to make sure that you're, you're looking at, uh, at, at the population, making sure that the, the population is, is, is growing and increasing. And this is something that at, at you should be looking at on a regular basis. So I would say at least every year you should be doing research on a particular market to see, you know, that's, that's usually where they, where the numbers are is on a yearly basis to see where, uh, where that population is going. Is it, is it growing? Is it going down? Is it stagnant? You got to know those numbers. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't invest in one of those markets, but you got to at least know that, right? You got to know that a market is not growing if you want to be able to talk to investors about that. Because if you find something wrong with the market, whether there's high crime or, you know, no negative population growth, you got to have a story behind that as to why you would still want to invest in that market. Whether you know that there's, you know, new manufacturing coming in or new, new this or new that or, you know, something from the economic development com committee has something going on in that local market and you know that from, from talking to them. But you got to have a story behind it. You can't just say, oh, they're, they're, that's just negative population. It's not really going to affect us because this particular property has, is 100% occupied. That's, that's not a very good enough. That's not a good enough story. So you want to make sure that you're doing that research properly. And again, when you're doing that population analysis on that website for the census, you can find information about uh, their, the, the age of the population. So you want to make sure that the age of the population is, uh, is there as well. So that not, not that the age is there, but you can see the breakdown by age. So if you're trying to buy a 55 plus you know, community, then you want to make sure that you have enough population to support that 55 plus community. But 
if your primary demographic is going to be in that 20 to 30 year old range, then you need to make sure that you have enough people in that market to support um, uh, uh, buying in that, in that particular market. Because you can look at the data and see is that, is that particular demographic growing or not. You know, one of the markets that I did a lot of research on is Charlotte, North Carolina, and that's the market that I look in right now is, is Charlotte, North Carolina, and that market is the is one of the number one population uh, growth markets for millennials. So there's a lot of millennials going into that market, and so being that way, that's a that's a great market to be in for your traditional, you know, B, C class properties because millennials, that's what they're doing. They're buying in those, in those B, C class prop, mostly probably the, the, the B's and then possibly some of the C's depending on what, the, what industry that they're in. But there's an influx of millennials into the Charlotte market. And we, I wouldn't have known that if I didn't start doing some research on it. And, uh, and some of the, some of the you know, most basic research that you can do is, is just Googling that city and typing certain keywords like, you know, population growth, Charlotte, North Carolina, or, you know, crime rates, Denver, Colorado. But when I go back to my example of Denver, Colorado, for example, for, for, for per se here that we were referencing earlier, the Denver, Colorado market, there are sub markets within Denver that are really good. And then there are some sub markets within Denver that are not so good. And so you want to make sure that when you're doing research that you also look at the granular piece of a market, especially when you're looking at a property. That's really what I would say is, is, is looking at a market is, is knowing exactly where uh, the, 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 the growth of the city is going. And I'm going to show you a resource, resource later on, which some of you might have heard of before, but some of you might not, um, that you can go to to find out more information about the sub-markets. Because just because a market like Denver is, is a good market or Atlanta or Jacksonville or whatever is a good market, it doesn't mean that every asset that you find in that market is going to be in a good sub-market. Because there are some sub-markets in some of these larger cities that have negative population growth. And so you want to make sure that you pay attention to that because you can really get caught with your pants down, if you will, um, if you're not careful by investing in a market that is not growing. And then, you start, then, you, then you're not going to be able to uh, push the rents higher than that particular market, especially when you start looking at another demographic, which we're going to talk about, um, which is median household income growth. So if you look at the median household income over a trend, over a period of time, and you find that uh, you're not able to and you find that there's either negative median household income growth or it's been static the last five or 10 years. Well, guess what? If you're trying to increase the, 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 the rents on that property, I, I don't care really what these other properties are doing. It's going to be very, it's going to be hard. It's going to be harder than you think, you know, so you might, instead of taking 12 months to stabilize that property into the increased rent growth, you might want to project in your underwriting that it's going to take 24 months, you know, maybe 36, depending on, on that particular uh, area. So you just have to make sure that you're paying attention, attention to that. And, uh, and so, and again, this, this particular, um, uh, webinar is not to tell you to invest in a particular market. I'm just giving you some resources and some ways to do some market research on your own. Because at the end of the day, you need to do this research. You need to figure out what's best for you. Because as you start to do this research, you're going to find that you'll be able to, you'll be, you will be able to talk to investors much better about the market that you've chosen because you have done, the, done your research on your own. And so one of the other things that uh, we're going to look at is crime rates. So again, I'm going to show you a resource here in a few minutes once I share my screen to actually go over some of these um, high level things to talk about crime rates because you want to make sure that there's not a lot of high crime in the area and in the market because if there is high crime, then again, it's going to be a little bit harder of a, of a, of a property, a little bit harder of a, of, a, of a market to go into and you want to make sure you know that. And so we're going to, I'll show you a research on how to be very specific to, to a market and not just, uh, you know, taking, um, again, my energy lights. Uh, I need to get something so I can stop doing that. And then, of course, so when we're looking at the crime rates, I'll show you a resource on that here in a few minutes. And then you want to look at unemployment. Make sure unemployment numbers are going down or not going way up because if you do that, uh, if, if you want to make sure that you understand what that market is doing, because if you start to see that the unemployment numbers are going up, you need to do some more deep diving into why that's happening. So is there a particular, you know, industry or, 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 or market that's actually causing that to happen? 
And then you also want to look at, so we talked about population, make sure you look at the population, the population age. We looked at specific crime rates to a particular market and then unemployment. So those are some, so, so those are four things right now that we've talked about that you need to be looking at. And then also looking at the job diversity in that market and those, and those top employers that are in a market. So, you know, every, everybody's a little bit different as far as their tolerances and the types of different types of markets, but there are some markets that are skewed more, um, you know, military or more hospital or, you know, more uh, one industry versus the other. And so you have to make sure that you understand the dynamics of that particular industry to know, you know, you know, maybe is, is, is it more volatile of a market than, than other markets because of the types of industries that are there. And so you want to make sure that you look at that. And, you know, one thing I'll say here is, is, you know, I, I don't necessarily um, say that it's a bad thing to be in a market that's very high military, but you just have to know that going into it because if for some reason you try to buy a property that has a, a large number of military people that are renting from you, then you might not be able to get a, a good loan on that property, some good debt. Because some of the lenders, especially these, these, the Fannie Mae and the Freddie Macs and some of these bridge lenders, you know, they don't want to see um, a, a large number of people that are in one demographic or one industry in your property. You know, there's two things that I've seen recently when we were trying to get loans on properties is number one, they don't want to see any more than about 25% corporate leases. So we were, we, we put an offer on our, on a building recently that one of the entire units, the entire building was, uh, uh, rented out by a, by a local large corporation and an international corporation. It's a fully furnished apartments and stuff like that. But we had to make sure that it didn't exceed that 25% threshold or the lender would get a little bit scared. And quite frankly, I'd get a little scared too. Um, Cause if something happened to that corporation and it wipes you out, that could really affect the returns for you and your investors. The second thing is, uh, uh, from uh, is, is for the, the military. So if you have more than 25%, sometimes it's a little more than that. Sometimes it could be 50%. But I think for the most part, most of these lenders, if it goes above 25% uh, military, then they get a little bit scared too. They might, you know, they might not necessarily not give you the loan, but you might have to put a little bit extra in reserves, you know, as a, as a backup just to be on the safe side to make the lender a little bit more comfortable. So, you know, obviously making sure that you know what type of industries are, are more popular in that market is, is really what you want to look at. So, talk, so the next thing here is, is supply and demand. When you look at supply and demand, um, there's a resource that uh, I don't actually have it up on my screen to show you um, on the, and when I start to show you my resources that I'm, I'm, I'm going to give to you, but um, you can write it down. It's called weareapartments.org. And they have research on a lot of the different markets on the supply and demand. And it's a really good resource because it will show you the types of markets that have the, the, the supply of new apartments coming online and the demand of those, those, mar those particular um, properties going to be all the way to like 2030. So uh, it's a good resource. You know, it's one of those reasons why I, uh, uh, there are certain markets that I don't want to invest in because their supply is outpacing the demand between now and 2030. And so I don't want to get caught in that market because the moment that the new supply outpaces the demand is when it starts to trickle down into other cl asset classes. That's when the, the, the class A new properties start to come online and they can't fill them. Guess what they do? It's called concessions. They start to give away a lot of things and bring a lot of people from the, the B-class neighborhoods into the A-class neighborhoods. And then you start to have to reduce the rents for the B-class. And then because yeah, the C-classes are going to go into the Bs and it kind of trickles down. It takes a couple of years to do that. But I definitely don't want to get caught in a market like that because it can be, definitely um, affect the, the performance of a property and really cause your underwriting, your initial underwriting to kind of go awry. So make sure you look at the supply and demand on that website, weareapartments.org. I'm also going to, um, you can also go to the census website. So all these things are freely available on the census website, but I'm going to show you a couple other resources where you can be diving into the, some of these, these statistics and kind of, they kind of aggregate some of this data. So uh, the next is vacancy rates. So you can look up historical vacancy rates on the census website. So you can, you can also look up what the median rents are in a market on that website. So they give you all of those resources to be able to find um, vacancy rates, median rents, also the building permits for five units or more in a market. They can give you how many permits have been issued for those, for those, those properties. So 
That way, you know how many A classes or how many new buildings are being built right now in that market. If there's a market that has a lot of them coming online, it's probably a pretty good market. Otherwise, they wouldn't be doing that. And again, you have to kind of balance that with um, the weareapartments.org and some other resources that allow you to determine, is there enough demand coming into that market to support it? And so some of you might, you know, have thought what I thought, you know, years ago is, you know, how, how can we, how can we continually add more and more and more of these properties, you know, and continue to fill them? And that's because the population is constantly growing and you have to constantly have more. Like, like you can see over here, over my left shoulder, you know, I, I have a family, I got my wife and I have our, our four kids, right? Well, the, these, these four kids are going to need a place to stay. So guess what? They're going to probably be renting apartments one of these days or whatever. Um, and so, or, or buying a house or whatever the case may be. And so that, again, that's me, just my wife and I have increased the population by four additional families, right? So you can see that how, as we continue to grow and we start to expand, you're going to need to have more housing and more apartments. So again, the, the demand for these is going to continue to go up. And once that supply is not actually reaching the demand, that's when you started to see rents starting to go up. So because, that's because, because now you have more people looking for an apartment than you actually have apartments. And those, those rents are going to go up. So that's, a, that's actually, it's, it's a good thing and a bad thing because it's good for investors because we can see an increase in our returns and an increase in the valuation of our properties based on the increasing of the NOIs on the properties and the compression of the cap rates upon exit. And so we have an increase in our valuation. Um, so it's a great thing for, for returns, but at the same time, it's, it's kind of, you know, not so good for an economy when you don't even have a place for people to live. So that's why there's a lot of, you know, affordable housing people, investors that are in the market. And I'm not personally an affordable housing, you know, investor but there are many people that invest in affordable housing, you know, complexes and there's a need for that. It's just not a space where I'm at. You know, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to always be where the need is or maybe, you know, be there. Um, but uh, cause there's, there's definitely plenty of money to be made across the entire board. All right. So those are the, the, the main things that we look at population, population, age, crime rates, unemployment, job diversity, and the top employers. And of course the supply and demand in a particular market. Let me see if there is anything else here that I wanted to cover. Nope, that's pretty much it on those. And so I'm gonna turn my computer screen around here a little bit and show you, um, let's see if I can share my screen here. All right, one question. As, you, as I'm going through material, if you have questions, you know, make sure in the, if you're on Zoom platform, you type them into the, uh, the Q&A box there. It helps me when they're all in just one, one particular section. And then, uh, and don't put them on the, the chat box. If you're on, you, on YouTube, after we've done the webinar, um, you can pipe the comments into the question box below. Also, be sure to hit the subscribe button to subscribe to our YouTube channel and get our future you know, recordings. And then also, if you're on Facebook, go ahead and type any questions that you have into the comments box. I'm trying to monitor all this at the same time. So um, please, uh, please do that. And let me see if I can share my screen here and get this going. All right. I'm going to go over a couple of uh, reports that we look at first. And then we will go over some other pieces here. All right, so that is that box. Bear with me just a minute here, folks. Just trying to get the screen shared. I have a really large screen, so I have to make sure I only share a certain amount of my screen. So let me share this. Otherwise, it just comes out weird on your, on your piece, so. All right, so hopefully you guys can see that okay. Hopefully that comes out pretty clear. Um, one of the things that we look at, this is a report that is uh, put out by Zillow. And as you can see, this is from 2017, so it's a little dated, but it's the only one that I could find for me to present to you. So I thought something was better than nothing. So this is a report that you can use and as you go through it. And all, all these reports I'm going to show you kind of give you a little bit different look and different ways to kind of look at things. So um, don't just take one of these things at face value as, as that's the only thing. So make sure you kind of, you know, you have a, have a, 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 res a, a way to kind of go back and forth with these things. So hopefully you guys can see all of this about what I'm doing. But this is the... Um, 
uh, Zillow uh, report, Consumer Housing Trends report. There's not really very many things that's specific to multifamily in here, but I'm going to show you a couple of things that I like about this report. You can see this section here called Renting in America. Obviously, they have buying in America and selling in America and owning a home, but this Renting in America can all, really give you some good insights into the the, the, the the rental market in the United States and the rental um, some of the some of the mind the the, the, the the thoughts behind some of the people in this space. So I'm just going to go to this first section that talks about the uh, renting in America. So one of the things that I like about this is this piece, uh, the typical American renter kind of talks about really helping you shape what your demographic is going to be and who your tenant is going to be is doing some research on this particular product, which is, you know, this particular report, which talks about the typical American renter. The next thing is, it also, so here we go. We can see median age of a renter is 32 years old. And again, this is U.S. as a whole. It's not specific to a market, but kind of still gives you a better idea. Median household income, 37.5. You can see that 50% are millennials. And so that 20, 30, 23 to 37 age range. So when you're looking at a market and you're doing population analysis, you want to make sure that a good majority of your population is in that millennial um, a millennial age range. If you have a lot of them that are skewed 38 plus, guess what? You're leaving out 64% of your population by not having that in your demographic. So you want to make sure that you use something like this as a resource to see. Um, you can see that the, the, the race breakdown and the marital status. Uh, it's interesting there, 48% single, 33% married, and then 19% unmarried partner. And then education, you can see the education of your, of your particular uh, tenant base as well there. So this is a good resource to be able to review. Um, it's from Zillow. Uh, let's see, eight and 10 renters saw rent increase in the past 12 months. So again, when you're doing market research, it's not just a one-time thing. It's a constant process. You should always be looking for these types of reports. There's a couple of websites later on that I'm going to present to you and show you um, of where what you, something that you should subscribe to and be following so you can be a part of the conversation around multifamily so you're aware of different things that are happening. Next thing here is the wants and needs. This was really cool because they go through and they talk about required and desired home characteristics for rentals. So we could go in here and talk and it says, you know, is the rental within my initial price range? And, you know, has it, does it have air conditioning and you know, ample storage and pets and all this kind of stuff. And so it gives you a breakdown of the wants and needs and things that are desired inside a, a particular a property so that you know what to include. Next thing here is required and desired building and neighborhood characteristics. So what, a, what this report to me does is it helps me understand my tenant. It helps me understand some of the things that I might want to look at this and go, is there something else that my property doesn't have that I could add that would allow for me to attract more people? Because if you have more demand than you have supply, that again, it allows you to be able to increase your, your rates. You can increase your rents. When you increase those rents, um, you can increase the NOI and again, exponentially increasing the value of your property upon exit. So that's what this particular product is for. It's, it's, it's again, it's uh, called the uh, Consumer Housing Trends Report of 2017. That went to 2018. The next one here is from CBRE. And some of these other reports that you'll see, you know, uh, if you have a broker with CBRE or, you know, Marcus and Millichap or whoever, they can get you these reports. So they usually have these reports available. Um, so you can actually see that. So I see a question came in here about where, what, what, what website do we use for, for, for targeting crime rates and submarkets? I will show you that here shortly. I'm going to go over these reports, and then I'll cover that. So stay tuned for that, Paul. So this is a cap rate survey. Again, this is not just for multifamily. You can see at the top here, it's for you know, office, industrial, retail, multifamily. So you want to make sure you click on multifamily to go to that. And you can see these different asset classes and be able to see um, where they actually are as far as cap rates. Because a lot of people have asked, you know, well, how do I know what the cap rate is in my market? Well, this is a good resource to be able to kind of have an idea as to what the cap rates are doing in your particular market. You can actually see what these particular um, markets are doing. And so a lot of times what I'll do in these types of reports is I'll just do a search for the city that I'm looking for. Because again, 
these, 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 some of these reports are limited and that they, only, they don't do sub-market research. They just do major market research and they don't do all of them. So some, re, some reports do some markets and some do others. So you want to make sure that as you're doing your research, you're researching, um, uh, you're, you're looking at multiple markets and various things like that. And so, but this is a good report to be able to use and to analyze, to be able to, to determine where um, you want to be, you know, investing it within, within multifamily. So very good, good report to use. You can see that it breaks it down by class A, B, C, um, and it has cap rates for stabilized properties, expected return on cost for value added properties. So it kind of gives you a ballpark as to where some of those cap rates might be in that particular market. So it's a good report to use. The next one here is this one uh, real estate advisor, RCL Co, state of the real estate market. It's a really good one. Um, we're running out of time here because I want to get to some of these websites. So I'm just going to go through these reports real quick. This is one called the IRR. This is not to be confused with internal rate of return for returns. This is the Integra Realty Resources publication. And you can get this to be able to review some of the um, various pieces. This goes through a lot of different types of markets, golf courses, retail, senior housing, marijuana, real estate, you know, office, housing, interest rates. And of course, they have this one on multifamily as well. So there's, there's, there's a lot of research on this. I like this one because they also put it onto this little wheel here, which tells you kind of where that particular market is, whether it's kind of towards the recession cycle, the recovery phase, expansion, or hyper supply. And so you can see that if you, if you want to look at your city, kind of see where you actually are in this particular um, uh, market cycle or wheel. So that's a good report. The next one is this one from Price Waterhouse Cooper, the emerging trends in real estate. And you can see through here as you're going through, there's apartments in here, goes through and gives you a lot of statistics and numbers. Again, I'm just trying to give you a high level overview of different reports that you're trying to look at. Um, I don't have time to go to each, go into each one of these things and pull out a piece for your particular market, but you should be writing down all these reports or watching the video again once we release it so you can actually get a copy of some of these reports. Next thing here is from Marcus and Millichap. This is the last report I'm going to go over um, and from as far as PDF reports, and then we're going to go over some uh, uh, resources online that you can use. So this is the 2018 North American Investment Forecast for Multifamily from Marcus and Millichap. You can see it goes through all the different markets right here. These are the markets that it's, that it's covering, even some of the Canadian markets. U.S. apartment overview, kind of go over there to page seven on that. So there it is here, completion versus net absorption in the trends over the years. And then, of course, vacancy by classes and rental growth by classes. And so you can kind of see how it gives you a lot of information. It gives you a lot of information to be able to look at and to research. You can't just look at one report. You should always be looking at this. So this particular one, um, I think, is what Robert was asking. This is a 2018 multifamily North American investment forecast by Marcus and Millichap. Again, if you have a representative or a broker at Marcus and Millichap, just ask them to send you the most recent investment forecast for North America, and they can send you this report. Um, they don't usually charge for these things. If you ask them for the brokers, at least I have never been charged for them. But all these reports are very good resources to use. So let me see if I can give you access to a different uh, uh, website resource here. In just a second here, trying to pull this up, manage a couple things at the same time. So let's see here. So this is going to be the website um, that we use. Uh, not that one, not that one. Give me just a second, folks. I'm going to give you a screen share of, there we go. All right, so you should now be able to see the, uh, the census website here. So this is the factfinder.census.gov. And so if you go to this website, you will be able to see um, what I was referring to as far as doing research on a particular market. So um, 
It's a call. If you just go to um, factfinder.census.gov, and then you can go in here and just type in a particular uh, a county or, or area or whatever and be able to do some research on your particular area. And they have all kinds of stuff in here. So it's amazing how much research and information we have available, income levels and you know, um, 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 employments, and it goes all the way from the states to the counties. And again, the smaller the market, the smaller the amount of data that's going to be available for that particular market and the, the smaller amount of um, updating and research they're going to actually do as well. So, all right. If you are interested, I know there's been several of you that are like, what's the name of that report again? Or, you know, what's the, what, how many of these are available online for free and, you know, various things like that. If you will, um, uh, trying to think of the best way to get a, a PDF to you. If you go to our website and, uh, well, you, for those of you who are on this webinar, I have your emails because you're on the webinar. So if you're on our Facebook platform and you wanted to um, get access to these, shoot me an email, dan at multifamilyinvestornation.com, and I will send you a copy of these. Um, I'll, I'll put these out on a little PDF, some resources and some links and various things like that, so in, the, in the names of these reports, so you can have them to be able to use for your research. Um, I think I could probably put that together for you really quickly. So that should not be a problem. Um, but anyway, so this is, this is the census website. The other website that I like is this city data website. This is the one that I was talking to you about that allows you to get specific down to the actual submarket. So let me just give you an example here. I'm just going to click on Charlotte, North Carolina, and you're going to be able to see that it'll drill down to, you know, population, males, females, median, all that kind of stuff. But then it gives you this map here, okay? And on this particular map, you can actually see some of the trends in that market by, by the different colors and stuff, okay? Now, again, I'm not, this isn't a complete, you know, uh, webinar on how to use this tool and all that kind of stuff. So I'm going to go into a lot of detail, but you now have a resource where you can go in and play around and see median household income growth and the percentage change since 2000. So you can kind of see, you know, where those are. You can change these colors so you can read it a little bit better um, and see some of these different, you know, patterns and stuff. But you can see, like, if I look at this market right here, it's not showing that we're, we're doing real well, right? We're seeing as far as uh, um, like population growth, you know, there's, I mean, again, I'm just clicking on one and I haven't really modified these, but if you click on a particular market, there's a reason why some of them are purple and some of them are not so purple and some of them are, 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 are kind of a lighter color. And it's because there's a difference and the, and there, there might not be that much of a change in the median household income growth. So you can kind of click on that and then go, go a little bit deeper into that particular um, submarket to really go granular on that particular submarket to see what has been the growth over the last, you know, 16, 17 years, 15 years, however long it is. Is there growth? Is it static? Maybe I don't want to invest in that market and have that data available. So that's definitely a good resource for you. It's the city data com website. You have, this is the one that I also use for crime rates. So you can look at the crime rate. Um, there's usually a uh, it goes through a lot of different things here. So let me go down here. Usually the crime rates are towards the bottom, I believe. All right, food and environment, finances, yada, yada. I guess they don't want us to talk about the, uh, the crime rates. So they're putting it down towards the bottom here. I'm pretty sure it's towards the bottom. I might have missed it. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay, let's just go back up here. Anyway, there's, there's, there's information here about the, the crime rates in the market. I'm trying to see, maybe I missed it, because it's usually in this report. Let me see if I can pull it up here. Sorry about that. Um, either way, this, is, this would be a good resource for you to be very familiar with. I don't see it actually on here for some reason. But anyway, so the, this, this is a report that I would highly recommend that you bookmark on your, um, on your dashboard, making sure that anytime before you buy a property, you throw it up on here. That's what we do. We look at 
the crime rates, we look at the median household income growth, we look at the population growth, we're looking at a lot of different factors to make sure that even though Charlotte's a good market, we want to make sure that that sub-market is doing really well as the, at, the, at the same time, okay? So it just stated 57th in crime rate, I believe. Will it show more information than that? It will. So it actually gets down to the actual crime rates. So uh, it goes, let's see if I can find it here because I'm, I wish I would have found that earlier, but it usually, and they might have changed the, the, the format of this um, since I last did this. Um, let's see. Unemployment, historical, historical population. Uh, let me go into the other page and see if I can see it. All right. So let's just go into this particular submarket, and some you can see here it's the median household income, median house or condo value, median contract rent, unemployment, residents below the poverty level, median resident age. So you can kind of see that as well. Um, let's see, it might be in here. This is where I probably needed to be. Uh, crime. There we go. Murders, auto thefts, city data, crime index. So let's see here. This particular market. Does it actually show us? I was thinking it might have been shown us there. But there's a lot of different, there's a lot of data that's kind of built into these reports here. And they can go very granular, granular into a particular market. And so you want to make sure that you're doing that research on, you know, the crime rates and all the different specifics to a sub-market. Otherwise, um, when you go into a market, you're going to be going into it blind. You know, you want to make sure that you're going deep into a market and actually finding a lot of the data uh, to be able to report back to your investors as well and keeping track of that. So obviously we don't want to have very high crime. We want to have as low crime as possible. Um, it helps for when you're trying to, you know, sell it to tenants and the various things like that. Um, but also, you know, it helps you understand, you know, the types of tenants that you might be working with. You know, if you have high crime rate in your particular market, well, guess what? You probably have to do a lot of work on trying to keep them there or whatever. So that's the resource that I would suggest you use. You bookmark city-data. Um, it says most of the time city data will for most cities. I just did the word search and all it says is the number 57 stats. So yeah, it is kind of weird. I'm not really sure why. Usually it's in here, but um, maybe I'll do some research on that a little bit later and include it on that report that I'll send to you guys afterwards. So another website that's going to be good, I'm just going to drill through a couple of these sites, so make sure you write them down. Newgeography.com gives you a lot of um, information about various markets. The next one here is eco development or eco dev directory.com, the economic development directory. This kind of is a compendium or a comp compilation of all of the state websites that are about economic development in an area. So you can kind of see where everybody is and, and, and uh, um, as far as what kind of new development is going into a particular market. So you kind of know that as well. Another good resource to do is, is to know who to talk to in a market. So knowing that you should probably be reaching out to the economic development committee or the economic development development department in of a city to see what are some of the things that the city is actually planning on and doing over the next you know, you know year, 12 months, 30, 24, 36, five year, 10 year. Most of these cities will have some sort of you know 10 year plan or 20 year plan or whatever the case may be and getting ahead and go ahead and talking to those people will be very important. The next thing here is bls.gov. This is the Bureau of Labor Statistics. So there's a lot of good information there that you can drill down to the states. And then there's, there's uh, three there's four resources that I would suggest that you get a hold of. Well, three. Um, first is this one called Multifamily Executive. Um, it's just multifamilyexecutive.com. You can sign up for their email list. It doesn't, they don't charge anything for it. Um, I'm on their email list. Get emails probably at least once or twice a week from them and uh, get information about the multifamily market just in general. 
And then the same thing is with this other one, which is the Multi Housing News. So just go to multihousingnews.com and subscribe to their email list there. And, uh, and also on to this other one, which is housingfinance.com. So subscribe to all three of those email lists is what I would suggest that you do. And then I would also suggest that you uh, uh, do a, um, a, a, a Google alert for your market and the words multifamily or apartments or something like that so that you can be aware of anything happening around apartments or multifamily in the market that you're trying to go into because I get alerts all the time for the various markets that we have and I can kind of see some of the things that are happening now. Like, you know, if an apartment complex just burned down, I can kind of know that because I can file that away and go, huh, well, if that that particular property had a fire on it. Maybe when it comes available to buy in a year or two, I need to know that that happened if they don't tell me. So, because a lot of times they don't tell you because they either changed over property management companies and they forgot about it or whatever. But a lot of times that's, that actually helps out a lot. One of the ways that we found out about one recently was because uh, we looked at some of the online reviews on that property and found out that there was some water damage on that property. So, and then the last resource here that I have for you is CoStar. So many of you have probably heard of that before. It is a little bit expensive to do the entire United States or even just a, a, a market, um, but you can either use this or build a relationship with a local broker that has access to this and just ask them to send you the reports on a particular property in a market as you feel, as, as, as you need it. Because most of the time they'll usually have that available if they're the ones listing the property or whatever. And then that way you can get that information, that data, and you don't have to sell it or you don't have to do it yourself. So that always, that always helps whenever you're doing that kind of thing too. So uh, I would definitely suggest building your relationships with those brokers and also making sure that you uh, go through uh, and get those reports because those reports will be very important for you. Uh, they're very important reports. Hopefully these resources were helpful to you. I'm going to go through a couple of these questions. I won't have time to answer all of them because we only have a few more minutes here because um, I do have another uh, a meeting that I have to jump off to. But um, uh, we will continue the conversation tonight on Instagram. So if you have questions about these different markets and things like that, um, go ahead and go to Instagram.com slash Multifamily Investor Nation and follow us there. We'll be on nightly to answer questions for you, you know, around multifamily in general and uh, maybe even get a little cameo with some of my kiddos. So I do have four of them, as you can see behind me here. And uh, so we'll be able to see some of them. So Joe has a question here. I'm, I'm familiar with finding data. Curious how you recommend aggregating and ranking key performance indicators in Excel. So, you know, we do have an Excel spreadsheet that we use for some of our an analyzing. Um, I think that you have to do ask yourself what are some of the, the key indicators that you're looking for in a market because it's going to be different for, for everybody. But, you know, obviously, if you're looking at certain things, you can set them, set them, set things up in Excel. So as you're typing in some data, you know, and you can see that the population is negative, you can, you know, put a big old red, you know, box on there. Or if you see it being positive, you can see you have a go green or static being gray or whatever. And as you're putting that data in there, having the, 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 the spreadsheet change. You can do the same thing with Google Spreadsheets as well. So there's, there's, there's multiple different ways to do that. Um, I don't know if that really answered your question very well, but uh, hopefully that will be um, there as well. What websites do you target crime rates and submarkets? What techniques do you employ to determine if there is an incident of crime at a specific property? So two ways. So one of them obviously is that city data, city dash data website to find the crime rates and statistics. But if you're looking at a particular property and you're about to purchase it or put an LOI on it, one of the best things you can do is ask some of the local, uh, some of the local police officers. So I've met um, on some of the police officers, either I know, taking a break at a restaurant, meeting them there or calling or going down to the city department and talking to some of the people there about a particular property. Um, and they can give you some specifics about that as well. So that's definitely a good way to do that. A little bit more legwork, but definitely worth it if you're a little bit you know, scared or sketchy, if the particular area is a little bit sketchy. Which of these reports are free online? I do not have the answer to that. I do not know, um, but uh, I will give you the names of these reports. You can research them. The ones that are not available for free, most of the time you can reach out to some brokers and they'll have these reports available and you can ask them for it. But you want to ask some of the brokers that are in the multifamily arena with Marcus and Millichap and CBRE and you know Capstone Apartments and a couple of different you know resources like that. 
The next thing here is with the economy and bear market now, how closely does the multifamily arena follow? So, so you know, obviously, you know, I get questions about that all the time. You know, well, what about, you know, the multifamily market? Is it, is it going to be able to, to uh, is it going to stay like it is? Is it going to get better? Is it going to get worse? I don't know. Nobody knows. We're all in that space, stage of speculation. And so, obviously, you have to ask yourself, if the market does turn, would you rather have your money in the stock market or another volatile type investment, or would you rather have it in an investment like real estate, like multifamily, which when you look back at the trends back in 2008 when the market really tanked, that one of the most stable asset classes was multifamily. You know, the, 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 the typical default rate was about 4.5% um, in, in, in just general and in, uh, in, in real estate in general, um, and multifamily was like 0.4%. So there's a big difference in the, the the stability of you know buying single family or whatever versus uh, in commercial versus you know, in multifamily apartments like this. Because again, I would rather have my money in these types of investments than in the stock market because I know that I, my my investment is more stable. Plus. I don't like to pay as much in taxes, and so I get, of course, additional deductions and things like that and the, um, because of uh, depreciation. So I'm cash flowing and making money off these properties, but uh, because of that, I am not, uh, it's, it's also a, 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 a tax strategy for me as well. I'm not a tax accountant. I'm not a tax attorney. I'm not giving you tax advice, but I'm just giving you my own experience so you kind of know what my, more my thoughts are on that. So good question there. I know several of you have some other questions and various things like that. Uh, we will be posting the recording of this. And uh, if you're on our YouTube channel, make sure you hit the yellow button one way or another on the screen at the end of this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you have any questions, join us tonight. Uh, we're going to be on our Instagram channel answering questions are related to this particular webinar. So thank you so much. I went over time just a little bit. Hopefully you guys found this very valuable and uh, very helpful and uh, look forward to uh, seeing you at the multi Family Investor Nation Summit. So if you have not purchased your ticket, go to mfinsummit.com and register there, um, mfinsummit.com and do some more research there. We'll be posting the schedule of events coming up in the next day, I believe. Hopefully by tomorrow afternoon, we'll have the schedule up so you guys kind of know what the schedule is going to be like. So each one, we're going to have a lot of speakers, over 55 speakers. They're going to all have enough time to talk and present. We're not rushing through it. We actually have two separate rooms. We'll have room, room, room one and room two. And you'll be able to toggle between both rooms as you see fit as far as the speakers are concerned. All the sessions will be recorded. So even afterwards, if you want to review something again, you'll have the ability to do that. We'll have them up for about six to 12 months after the event. So thank you so much for all of you who have, who have joined us today. And thank you for all your help and getting us and, and promoting the Multifamily Investor Nation Summit for those of you who have tagged us and you know told us that you're coming and various things like that. So thank you so much. We'll uh, have another webinar next week, even though it is Christmas week. I will squeeze another webinar in. Might be a little shorter than this one, but hopefully uh, you'll be able to join us there as well. And, uh, and hope you have a wonderful Merry Christmas, and we'll see you after, the new, after Christmas.